Welcome to the Undisputed Podcast. I'm your host, Jenny Taft. This podcast is the full show from today's episode of Undisputed from start to finish. We've got a busy slate, so skip Shannon. Let's get to it. Good morning. Welcome to Undisputed. I'm Jenny Taft with Skip Bayless and Shannon Sharp. How are you guys doing today? I'm doing great. Watched the battle last night between Babyface and Teddy Riley, even though the equipment kept going in and out. That was unbelievable. And today, Skip Bayless, you and I are about to battle, and you're going down. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny to me, every day here on Undisputed is feeling like the last dance for Shannon Sharp. I, I don't know why. You know what? It's funny that how you could only remember the good, but never remember the bad. But that's OK. That's OK. It's, it's, it's your last dance. So I will let you have that. Speaking of the Last Dance documentary, since you guys set me up so well, after the first two episodes aired on Sunday night, everyone has been weighing in and sharing their thoughts, including Kendrick Perkins, who ended up coming to LeBron's defense, saying that no one has higher expectations than LeBron in NBA history. Perk went on to say, if Bron scores 63 and 49 in a series and gets swept, every sports network is talking about his inability to get it done while MJ is getting praised and awarded player of the game in losses. So Shannon, does Perk have a point here? One trillion percent. And we know <laughs> Perk very well. He is a guy that's very honest. He speaks his mind. And I commend him for that. But I've been saying that for years. I've never seen a guy in the history of sports get more praise and adulation for losing than one Michael Jeffrey Jordan. Now, the very same people that praised Michael Jordan when he dropped 63 and they lost condemned Devin Booker for scoring 70 and having a sign that read 70. These same people, one on our very network who happens to work with me, condemned LeBron James for 51-8-8 in the, in the Warriors game, game one, said he couldn't get it done. It was right there for the taking. But people forget, Jenny, but like I said, I just happened to be, I was graduating. That happened in April of, uh, of uh, 86. I graduated in June of 86. So I was 17, about to turn 18. People don't remember in that 63-point game, Michael Jordan missed a shot with two seconds left. Jenny, did you know that? And he had a turnover. Skip Bayless hate turnovers because he keeps harping on the ones that LeBron James had in game six. He had some turnovers. I mean, that was just God awful. Hold on. You mean to tell me in a loss, Michael Jordan had a turnover and he missed a game winning shot? How's that clutch? But let me tell you what, I just hope as time passes, it, time is as great to LeBron James as it has been to Michael Jordan. And you know why I say that, guys? Because I hope, hopefully, nobody will ever remember the misses only the makes like we do Michael Jordan. Ah, I am dumbfounded by what you just said, and especially by what my man Kendrick Perkins tweeted. You know, Shannon, I, I love Kendrick Perkins, mm -hmm. but I think I'm going to have to rename him Kendrick LeBron. Because every time I turn around, Kendrick LeBron is defending LeBron for some reason that boggles my mind. I, I'm starting to think that he's been hired as the new PR director for Unclutch Sports. I don't know that for a fact, but it's starting to feel like that. Because how could you dare to take a shot at Michael Jeffrey Jordan about his 49-point and 63-point games way back in 1986. And, and for Kendrick's sake, and maybe for our younger viewers' sake, Shannon says that, that he was old enough to sort of absorb what was happening in that game. Let me mm -hmm. provide Shannon's favorite word here, context, for that game back in 86. That Bulls team was 30 and 52. That's how bad it was, and it somehow made the playoffs. I don't know why, and they didn't deserve to. But we knew this story from the Last Dance documentary the other night that at the end, remember, Jordan missed uh, all, he, he only played 18 games that year. In the last 15 games, he was on a minutes restriction, seven minutes per half. 
and he wanted to make the playoffs by beating Indiana in the last game, and they pulled him with a few seconds left. And still, John Paxson hit a shot that eked them into the back door of the playoffs mm -hmm. they did not deserve to be in. But that, that was eight versus one, and one was the one. That was the Boston Celtics that Bird called in the Last Dance documentary the best team he ever played on. That team, by five games, was the best team during the regular season of 1986. Five games clear of Magic's Showtime Lakers. That team was number one in holding down uh, opponent's field goal shooting percentage, and it was number three in points allowed. And Kevin McHale was first team all defense, and Dennis Johnson, who mostly guarded Michael Jordan that day in those two games, was second team all defense. That's what Michael Jordan was up, to get up against with a team that was 30 and 52, and he had not been playing very much going into that first round series. So he scores 49 in the first game, and then he scores 63 in the second game to force an impossible, improbable, huge upset of not one overtime, but two overtimes. And how did he do that, Shannon Sharp? At the end of regulation, he got fouled with no time left on the clock shooting a jump shot. It was actually from three, but in those days, they had just moved the, the free throw line, I mean, the three point line back. So it was only a two shot foul. And he had to go by himself. It would have been LeBron's worst nightmare and stand at the free throw line alone with nobody in the lane and make two free throws just to send it to overtime. And he swished both of them. So don't give me mm -hmm. unclutch. I'll give you 63. It took two overtimes. But after the game, Larry Bird uttered the immortal quote, it felt like it was God disguised as Michael Jordan. When have we ever heard anybody say that felt like it was God disguised as LeBron James? I, I've never heard that before. I'm, I'm sorry. And <laughs> my problem with LeBron James is, Shannon, uh, we go back and forth nearly every day. It feels like the media today gives LeBron James more passes that, than he throws when he doesn't want to take the last shot. He's constantly passing the ball because it's the right play. And the media is constantly giving a, him a pass for that. And, and now Kendrick LeBron is saying that, that Jordan got too many passes for not winning that. They had no chance. That Celtics team was on a roll that was going to result in the championship. That was the best team in basketball. They went and won the finals over the Houston Rockets in six games. How, how can you dare to try to demean or degrade what, what Michael Jordan did? Yeah, they got swept, but, but to even get game two, I mean, uh, yeah, game two to overtime was, was impossibly great. Whoa, uh, talk, about, talk, about, talk, about, talk about Skip. Whoa, whoa, what kind of animal is a yabba? I've never seen that before, and I've seen a lot of different animals, been to four continents, and I haven't seen that yet, but you see, you keep praise, you keep saying, who can get a team, score 63 against the big three Celtics? You said all of that, but at the end result, what was the end result? You and everybody else, when LeBron James averaged 36, 13, and 9, how can you give a guy a finals MVP in a losing effort? The very people that are heaping praise on Michael Jordan for catching an L. Skip, how's it taking a shot at somebody if I'm speaking the truth? You do realize Michael Jordan in the last minute of that double overtime and in, in the second overtime, he had a turnover. That's not taking a shot. That's fact. You love facts. You, hold up. How's this taking a shot if he missed a shot that would have won him the game? You kill LeBron. You keep talking about the big three Celtics. They went on and won the title. What about the Spurs? What was that record? They had the best record in the NBA. You remember in 2007 when he got swept? Okay, what about the Warriors? Did the Warriors not have the best record? He beat a team that won 73 games. You keep talking about the Celtics, Celtics, and they were great in the 80s. Comparable to the Celtics in the 80s were the 2014, 2017, 2018 Warriors. But nobody wants to talk about KD. If KD is a great player when it comes to, when it comes to like he beat LeBron. He's great, but in the pantheons, nobody wants to say how great KD is. He's great. He's historically great. So is Steph Curry. But 
everybody poo pooed them <laughs> until they beat LeBron. Then when they beat LeBron, when they beat LeBron over there, LeBron choked. LeBron, he's not clutch. If LeBron scores 51, the most points in the finals lost, eight points, eight rebounds. Oh, he's unclutch. Michael Jordan would have won that. No, he didn't. Michael Jordan got swept every time he didn't have a guy named Scottie Pippen. Name the series in which Michael Jordan didn't get swept in which he had Scottie. And I'll just wait. You take as much time as you need. I need you to tell me the series in which he didn't get swept in which he didn't have Scottie. Okay, Shannon Sharp. We're going to talk about this later, so I'm not going to go into great detail here. Scottie Pippen was a nice player. He was a really good player, but he was nothing but a good Robin. You know it, and I know it. And yes, Michael needed a little bit of help because you do need five players on the court at one time. And as no. great as he was, no, he don't. needed one other pretty good player. He needed one other pretty good player, and at least he didn't have to take his talents to South Beach to join forces whoa, with Dwayne whoa, Wade, whoa, who was whoa, a much whoa. better player whoa, and whoa, leader see? and a much see, clutcher see? player <laughs> and mentally tougher player than Scottie Pippen ever dreamed of being. And he joined forces with Dwayne Wade, who taught him how to win championships, and with Chris Bosh, who was a perennial all-star in Toronto. Michael had one all-star in Scottie Pippen, but he wasn't anything like Dwayne Wade as a leader and a big brother figure. LeBron needed a big brother. That's why he went, he took his talents to South Beach. Well, well, and by the way, we're talking about a 63 point game in Michael's second year in the league in which he had broken his foot and played only 18 games. Help me out here, Shannon Sharp. In LeBron James' second year in the league, how many playoff games did the Cleveland Cavaliers win? Uh, go ahead, tell me, I'm waiting. They didn't win any, but you just told me that they Michael Jordan the didn't desert. They didn't, no, yeah, Michael Jordan did make the playoff in his second year, and you said he shouldn't have made it because they, there was what? What did you say that record was? 40, uh, uh, 40 and 42? 30 and 52. 30 and 52. You said. You said they shouldn't have made the playoffs. Now you're talking about LeBron. Look at LeBron's record in his second year. I yeah. guarantee you it was better than 30 and 52. But he didn't make the playoffs. But that's hey, neither here nor there, Skip. You keep... It's, it's here. You keep... T no, you keep telling me LeBron James had to get help. But you just told me Michael Jordan needed some help. If I'm thirsty, if somebody brings me water or if I find water, as long as I quench the thirst, the job is done. LeBron had to go get help because they wouldn't bring it to Cleveland or they wouldn't come. He went to Miami. But I'm just trying to figure it out. You still have a told. Le Michael Jordan was getting swept by the Bucks with one Hall of Famer. One. Sidney Moncrief. Al Lister, can I interest you in him, Skip? Huh? Randy Whitman, can I interest you in him? You, you like him? Well, what about Junior Bridgman? Junior Bridgman is an all-time great businessman. He was a good basketball player, but LeBron James getting swept by Tim Duncan, Manu Ginobili, Tony Parker. Oh, you terrible, LeBron. He gets swept by four guys that's going to the Hall of Fame. KD, Steph, Clay, oh, Draymond, LeBron. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because, as we know, in 2007, what was that, LeBron's fourth year? He did get swept yeah, by he was 22. Spurs. They did have three yes. Hall of Fame-bound players on them. And guess what LeBron mm -hmm. averaged in that series? 22-7-7. Yes. Seven and seven. He shot 36% from the field, did LeBron James. That was 32 of 90 shots. That's not very good. Okay. He shot 20% from three. That's really not very good. And as usual, he shot only 69% from the free throw line, which has always been his Achilles heel or feel, should I say, especially in big games and playoff games. So he put up yes. incredibly pedestrian numbers as he got swept. Mm -hmm. At least Jordan, after playing only 18 Sweet. games Sweet. in his second year in the <laughs> league, at least he scored Wow, 63? That still stands as the all-time playoff scoring record by a baby Jordan who only played 18 games in his second year. Wow, Shannon, yeah. you're trying to find fault with that? How outrageous is that? How, you're stupid you you do? to do you, that? It's, it's beneath you. See what you do, Skip? It's pathetic. Skip, Skip, let me ask you a question. Who has the most passing yards in an NFL playoff game in NFL history? Can you tell me the guy? 
I don't care at this point. We're talking about. Yeah, no, 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 you talk, goats don't need help. I say, well, Skip, LeBron needs some help. Not if you the goat. Well, if Michael Jordan is the goat, why did he need Scottie Pippen? He got swept every time he went to the playoffs without Scottie Pippen. And one more thing before I turn it back over to you. You do realize Michael Jordan was 23 when he got swept by the Bulls. When LeBron James got swept by the uh, Spurs, he was 22. 22 getting swept in the finals. 23 getting swept in the first round. Now, since, since we equating, we adding value to wins, to losses. Now, I don't know. I, I can't remember the last time we done that on this show. But since we doing that, which is more impressive? Getting swept in the first round at 23 or getting swept in the NBA Finals at 22? You do the math. Shannon, Michael Jordan, even with Scottie Pippen on his side, was still trying to fight through some of the greatest teams in the history of this league. Mentally what? tough, physically tough basketball teams such as the Bad Boy Pistons. And obviously, we just talked about Bird Celtics. And finally, they broke through against Magic Showtime Lakers once Kareem was retired. But once they broke through, I don't even have to remind everyone that Michael Jordan went 6-0 and in the finals with six MVPs. I'm sorry. It's beyond anything LeBron could ever conceive. He's three and six in the finals. And I want to ask Kendrick Perkins this question, or as I'm now calling him Kendrick LeBron. What happened when Kendrick was a Celtic in the last playoff series that LeBron played in before he took his talents to South Beach? The last go round in Cleveland, what happened? Uh huh. LeBron played one great game in game three at Boston Garden, and then right on time, he disappeared in games four, five, and six. How does Kendrick defend that, I would like to know, because it got so bad that Dan Gilbert, the Cavaliers owner, accused LeBron of quitting in those games. Did even the two Jerrys, Krause or Reinsdorf, ever accuse Michael Jordan of quitting in a playoff? No, nobody would. That, that's a thought that couldn't even go in anybody's head. But LeBron shrank in that series and faded until one of his insiders had to tell ESPN, oh, he had to be sedated before those games because he was having an issue with a teammate in the locker room. Baloney. Well, Stop skip, it. Skip, then he takes his talents to South get... Beach. And what, what happened, Shannon? What happened in South Beach? His first no. big... The NBA Finals with the Miami Heat. He disappeared. He melted down. The chosen one became the frozen one. How does Kendrick Perkins defend that? He, again, everybody gave LeBron a pass for that, except me. You, you can't be the GOAT and melt down in games four, five, and six against the Dallas Mavericks. Let's be honest. Let's put it all out on the Whoa. table. What LeBron <laughs> hasn't been able to do, he's got so many epic fails on his record that Jordan never had. Skip, accusations are not factual. It says in the Bible, it said Noah was accused of drunkenness, but he still got the ark. So we'll debate that at another point in time when we go to Bible study, but let's go deal with these facts right here. If you remember, Skip Bayless, nobody put their teams together to beat the Bulls. If you remember, the Boston Celtics put their teams together to beat who, Skip? The Los Angeles Lakers. The Lakers put their team together to beat the Chicago, to beat Detroit, Pit uh, not Detroit, the Boston Celtics. Detroit put their team together to get past the uh, uh, Celtics and to beat the Lakers. Now, if you look at what the, the big Celtics uh, uh, 2.0 did, they put their team together to take down Goat James. The Warriors put their team together to take down Goat James. He broke up dynasties in Boston. That dynasty went down the turnpike or up the turnpike to Jersey. He broke that up. Skip, stop playing. He made the Warriors with a unanimous MVP, won 73 games, go get the second best player in the NBA. That's what he did. Now, Skip Bayless, if you want to say Michael Jordan is the GOAT, hey, we're going to debate that to the end of time. 
But what I'm tired of y'all trying to do is to make it seem like he had no flaws. He had no faults on the court, and he did because he missed a shot in game five. You remember the, the NBA Finals when Tony Kukoc hit that three that got him in striking distance and Michael Jordan missed the final shot? You remember that, right? So that happened. Yeah. So what, when, when, yeah. when, when, hold on, when, when uh, LeBron misses a shot, he's on clutch. Jordan misses a shot. Oh, he didn't have help. Man, stop this. I, Skip, I'm not trying to, look, I will never, ever diminish the guy. All I'm asking you to do and all I'm asking the people that saw Michael Jordan and that are cool with Michael Jordan, call it like you see it. If 63 points in a loss, if you lost, if the end result is an L, say that. Don't heap praise on what he did because LeBron James has some virtuosos. He's called the L and you crushed it. That's all I'm saying. Okay, all I'm saying is let's be honest about what happened when LeBron had his playoff high, 51 points, game one at Oracle 2018. You know what happened. I told you the next day on Undisputed, hey, I've never seen him have a hotter hand from long range, from shooting outside, than he did that night. And he had 49 points all the way up to the last shot of regulation. And again, he gets the switch he wanted, and he had the Michael Jordan Memorial, just sort of free throw line jump shot on Steph Curry, and he turned it down in favor of kicking it to George Hill as he cut to the basket. Clay did the right thing and fouled him, and George Hill missed one of the free throws, and it cost them the game, and obviously the long rebound went to JR, and he lost his mind for a second. And then LeBron lost his mind. Let's be honest about what happened. See? LeBron went to the <laughs> bench in, in the break between regulation and overtime, and he pouted. He sat three seats down from his teammates' huddle, and he, would, he didn't want to associate with his team. He hung his head, and his body language said, I don't want to be part of this anymore. And he continued to pout into overtime, because he refused to even take a shot for the first two and a half minutes of that overtime, and they fell behind by seven points and could not make it up. He scored only two points the rest of the way in that overtime, and they got blown out basically in overtime by 11 points. That was shameful. That was not goatish. That, that was beneath LeBron's dignity to <laughs> pout like that because JR had a brain glitch. And in the end, that's something Jordan would have never done. Jordan didn't do that in see, the two-overtime game. I'm he sorry. Did. He made yes, the two he free throws to force overtime. Okay. He got an overtime. Hold on. But, oh, that's you prime now. Because remember, Skip Bayless, hold on. LeBron lost to a team that had three, three of the last four MVPs, the last two, uh, uh, the regular season, uh, uh, the finals MVP and KD, and, you and LeBron took them to overtime. So with four Hall of Famers, three MVPs, three of the last four MVPs on that roster, LeBron get them to overtime, and you're crushing it. Michael Jordan, the only MVP on the team was Larry Bird, and he gets them to overtime in which he missed the shot that would have won the game in the regular overtime, and then you praise it. That's all I'm saying, Skip Bayless. Two plus two got to be four. No matter why you do it, no matter when, where, why, and how, it's the same. So I want you to put that same kind of punishment, that same kind of pain on Michael Jordan. He missed the shot that would have won the game. He lost. He lost. He caught an L. Period. <laughs> enough Michael Jordan, enough LeBron for now. Save it for later. We'll get back to the debate. I want to talk about the Warriors next, guys, because one member of the team does not like the way Katie handled his last year with the Warriors. We'll tell you exactly what they said next. No mercy. Draymond Green sounded off on how Kevin Durant handled his last season in Golden State. Draymond said that KD should have let the team know that it would be his last season instead of leaving the elephant in the room. So, Shannon, do you agree with Draymond here? Hell no. Nah. Teams don't tell players, hey, this is your last season. We're going to trade you at the trading deadline. Or this is your last season here. I get it that Draymond said he wanted to be there. <clears throat> Clay Thompson said he wanted to be there. KD never said that. By all indications, by him signing only one-year deals, that gave you an indication that there was a great chance that KD was not going to spend his entire career in Golden State. Skip everybody else. There, there's a reason. Now, 
My thing is, okay, I get it. Let me, I'm gonna sign a one year, I'm gonna sign a two year deal. Basically, it's one plus one. And when, uh, if things go according to plan, see how I like it. Okay, Skip, he goes. They win the title, he's final MVP. He re signs again. One year, he's finals MVP. Hold on, Skip. He's not gonna get much better than that. You can't do any better than winning finals and winning finals MVP. It doesn't get any better than that. What KD, when KD got there, it wasn't what he had hoped. Because remember, Skip, he's like, oh, this, this what I get? This, this, this is it? So he never really feel he got, really uh, feels like he got the praise, the adulation that he thought would come along with a title. Skip. It's not KD's responsibility to tell anybody. They kept asking. Yes, I'm sure it caused a lot of anxious nights. Bob Myers, Joe, Joe Lacum, Steve Kerr, and the rest of them. Because they know that was the one guy. All things can be going to hell in a handbasket. KD, get us a bucket. And he could go do that. So he was, the, he was the guy that made them unbeatable, Skip. They became beatable. Without KD, they were very beatable. And they knew that. That's why they interrupted that man vacation on the Hamptons. Got on a big old jet. Flew out there, interrupted that man. He was out there with his good people, having a good old time. And here they come, ring, ding, dong. Man, sleepers. Man, who is this this time of the morning? It's them on his doorstep. Dre, uh, 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 Draymond hadn't stopped crying since the final. Eyes bloodshot red. K, 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 I, 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 man, I'm sorry, man, but we need you. So, no, I ain't telling you nothing. What I've decided to do, I'm going to decide at the end of the year. What you did do is speed up the process. I don't know what K when Draymond going to take responsibility for speeding up the process by calling that man out his name. That's what he did. But KD didn't owe, Skip, KD does not owe it to a team or his teammates to tell what his future plans are. When did that become in vogue? When, when must I tell you what I'm going to do? Because guess what? Organizations and corporations don't tell you what their future plans are. They just make plans. Oh, you traded. Huh? So KD says, you know what I'm going to do? At the end of the season, I'm going to sit down with my team, I'm going to sit down with my family, and I'm going to make a decision that's best interest of Kevin Durant. And that's what he did. He made a decision that was in the best interest of KD. Draymond, you got two titles that you probably wouldn't have got if you didn't have KD. Enjoy that. Keep it moving. And... I agree with everything you just said, Shannon. On top of that, Draymond Green has not stopped crying since the day Kevin left, <laughs> since the day di Kevin did sign with the Brooklyn Nets. And right now, it feels like he's just crying over spilled milk, milk that, to your point, he helped spill. And right now, it's hard to respect Draymond's points because He's crying from a position of weakness because this year, what's left of his Golden State Warriors have a record of 15 and 50. That is the worst record in the NBA as we speak. We have yep. no idea if this season is going to get to end, but those in Dub Nation right now hope that there's no more basketball because they would like to go on to the next season with no more <laughs> end to this one. Because Draymond Green right. basically got exposed this year for a bad basketball team. He averaged eight points, six rebounds, and six assists. Not bad on the six assists, but eight, six, and six. Eh, not great, Draymond. So it feels like to me, Draymond got swept up in watching the terrific documentary that dropped on Sunday night, episodes one and two, and he began to fantasize that his Warriors somehow deserved a documentary-worthy final season <laughs> of A Last Dance before <laughs> Kevin Durant left. And now to your biggest and best point, Shannon Sharp, that last season actually ended before it even really got off to a start because early in the year, as you know, sitting on the bench against the Clippers – that's when KD and Draymond got into it. They'd gotten into it on who's going to bring the ball up the court. And as you point mm -hmm. out, Draymond called Kevin Durant that B word that you just can't call another man without burning that bridge mm -hmm. completely to the ground. And we both agreed at that day, that next day, man, that relationship is basically over. Oh. That there can be no more yeah. real love, no more teammate-to-teammate -teammate love between those two. Mm -mm. And I get a little offended 
when current players compare what they're going through to what Jordan and those Bulls in 98, and I, of course, I was there covering for the Chicago Tribune, what they went through, because remember, Shannon, that team was united. It was completely together, com completely one for all and all for one against the two Jerry's. It was Michael and Phil and Scotty and the Bulls versus Jerry Krause and the owner, Jerry Reinsdorf. So, so again, we're talking about a, a Golden State team that was actually split from internally, where you had Draymond mm -hmm. getting mad at Kevin and calling him a word that you can't take back. You can't, you can't walk that back or make that up or apologize your no. way out of that one. Mm -mm. And, and mm -mm. so they were damaged from the inside out, and, and it was their own doing. It, they, they, they blew themselves up. It was internally. So my point is that, yeah, you're, you're right. Kevin never would commit publicly to what he was going to do. And, and the truth is, I don't think he knew. I, I buy the fact that from week to week, as he'd get asked by the media, as he went from city to city, he'd be like, the truth is, I don't know. I'm not sure. We got to see how the, all this plays out. And Shannon, my final point is, did Kevin quit on the Golden State Warriors that year? No. No. Kevin Durant fought his way back from a pull calf. Kevin Durant risked his career for Draymond and the other teammates to come back a little yes. prematurely in the playoffs so that, that he could try to help pull them out of a hole, and he tore his Achilles tendon, and it cost him this whole season. Well, well you can't fault that. You can't condemn him for, for <laughs> fighting all the way back no. and risking a whole year for Draymond and company, right? So, so again, right. I, I find no fault in what Kevin did. I was just Kevin being Kevin. And I find it, it feels like Draymond is trying to remind everybody of the good old days and how great they could have been when, in fact, Golden State, as we speak, is 15 and 50. <laughs> you know, Skip, if you listen to Draymond talk, Draymond said, you know, when, when the reporters would ask him, yeah, I want to be here. You know, I was here. I'm a foundation piece. I was here where it started. I want to continue this thing. They asked Clay, yes, I want to be here. You know, I was here when we were down and we built this thing. I'm a foundation piece. Kevin Durant wasn't a foundation piece. Kevin Durant was the slate roof. He made the house look better. That's what he was. And Kevin like, uh, -uh I'm more than slate. Y'all don't realize what y'all have here. And Kevin and, and you know, Draymond's like, well, he just gave the media his butt to kiss. Kevin Durant, look, I don't know, I don't really know KD, watching from a distance. But when I listen to KD talk, KD is about hooping. KD can, y'all can keep the press conferences. Y'all can keep all that other stuff. All I want to do is just let me hoop. If Kevin, Skip, if Kevin Durant could literally just go play basketball and not have to do post-game, not have to do pre-game, that's what he would do. That's what he do, he don't want to do anything else. But he understands that a part of that is, is selling that KD shoe is a part of being, you know, showing people your personality and showing a side that they can't get an opportunity to witness on the court. But Skip, Draymond, you got to let this go, bro. The, look, your girl left you. Now, she done got her a new man. Now, you can talk about she could have told me she was going to leave me and go hook up with uh, Joe. That didn't happen. That would have been all fine and good had she told you she was going to leave your butt. But you should have known. You kept asking her, did she love you? And she's like, boy, you're so crazy. <laughs> you're crazy. And you know, we, we together now. And that's what kept, Katie kept saying, Skip. He never said he loved him. He said, we together now. We'll see. Well, after three years, he was, he was done. It's okay. Draymond, you got two rings with, in three years with KD. Had KD not gotten injured, you probably would have had a third. But, bro, you can't be upset that the man left. Like you said, you, Steph, and Clay, y'all are the foundation piece. KD came in and joined that, and it was great, but he wanted to do something else. That's okay, too. You can't hold that man to get, you can't be mad at him because just like, but Skip, I told you, my grandma used to say, boy, kids, drunks, and angry people would generally tell you the truth. When Draymond got mad and he yet called KD that, he thought KD was that all alone because he joined a 73-win team. He always thought that a KD. He suppressed it 
But boy, Skip, when you get mad, you will say a lot of things that you wouldn't say if you was, you're like, nah, I'm gonna keep the peace. But the moment you get mad, you so and so, you know, you know what? And ta da, KB, like, did he just say that? Did that man just call me the B word? Oh my goodness. So, this is what you think of KD. I'm one of the two or three best players in all of basketball, and you think I'm a B. Okay, okay. I'm going to finish out this season, but it's never going to be the same, and I'm going to dip. I, I said, oh, you don't know. People say things. No, they don't. Oh, I've been in a lot of arguments with a lot of teammates. You know what line not to cross. You're lucky. Probably if you're in a football locker room, Skip, you got you to gotta, you, hey, you knuckle up. Hey, you're going to have to wall as simple as that. Now, I, under, hey, I yeah. understand basketball. They probably got a little different culture. I've never been in a basketball locker room. But call, hey, call the guy that and see what happened. Call the guy on the street that. You won't have to fight him. KD showed great restraint in not, in not going at uh, uh, Draymond. But, man, look here. It was over from that point. Being an athlete, being a prideful yeah. man, KD wasn't coming back from that. Yeah. They would have called the Golden State documentary of the last year the last <laughs> B word because that's what it was. That was the last <laughs> word. It was the B word. And it was basically over right there. And yet, looking back, it, it seems to me like Draymond should actually be thankful to Kevin because he did leave Russell Westbrook for them after Russell and Kevin had them down three to one in the conference finals. And help me out here, it, it feels like Kevin won Draymond two rings because Kevin was back-to-back -back finals MVP, and I don't know yes. that they would have won without him. So, okay, so he, yeah. he won two rings more than he probably deserved to. <laughs> and here's the thing, Skip. He got, he, he, the, Draymond, KD leaving with the reason Draymond got the max deal. How the hell you gonna give Steph, Steph uh, Curry a max contract, Clay a max contract, KD a max contract, and Draymond a max contract? How you gonna do that? Mm. You can't. So him leaving helped you get more money. Man. I agree. There's gonna be a documentary. No Warriors documentary just yet. Uh, I do want to go back to The Last Dance and find out from both you guys if there was anything from the first two episodes that you didn't like. We'll go there next on Undisputed. No mercy. Welcome back to Undisputed. All right, guys. Well, so many of us enjoyed those first two episodes of Michael Jordan's documentary, The Last Dance. Frankly, I've already rewatched it, but I do want to start with Skip on this one since you were there in Chicago for MJ's final season with the Bulls. Skip, has there been anything so far from the documentary that you haven't liked? Jenny, my man Shannon Sharp has all but accused me of selling out to my man, Michael Jeffrey <laughs> Jordan, here on Undisputed day after day. So for once and for a moment, I I'm going to be painfully objective. I have obviously loved the fact that this documentary has, has, I think, had huge impact on young people who can't grasp the greatness that I got to observe firsthand in 1998 in Chicago. And I'll be the first to admit, I, I've just never, ever seen anything like that Michael Jordan that year. Shannon, he was the epitome of athletic supremacy. He just looked the part. He was such a stallion in his uniform and in his post-game suits and even in his golf attire. He just looked the part. The great Tim Grover, his trainer, had him in just peak prime shape. He'd gotten more into weightlifting. And he just carried himself with such athletic dignity and such all-time dominating, just intimidating swagger. I, I can't tell you. That's why I'm, I'm happy the young people get to even see the, the video, just, just to watch the highlights in succession of how he took over games mentally and physically. And so given all that, I used to say, hey, Michael Jordan, when he's 50 years of age, will be able to average 20 points a game in this league. And then Sunday night, I'm going to be completely honest about this, <laughs> and I don't want to overstate it, but it was a little bit hard for me 
to watch a Michael Jordan that I rarely see interviewed get interviewed for, for long periods during this documentary. And he's 57 years of age now. I don't know when these interviews took place. He could have been 56, 55, even 54, but he's 57 now. And in a lot of these interviews that we've seen, he's got his ever-present cigar with him, almost like it's his, his security blanket. And I never thought Michael would need a security blanket. And he's got an ever-present drink beside him. And I'm not sure what it is, but it looks like it could be his <laughs> alcoholic not. beverage of choice. And as Shannon is. often makes fun of, we, we see the eyes and they're, they're a little bloodshot, just a little bloodshot. And he's let himself go a little bit. There's a little bit of a paunch showing. And he didn't dress up for these interviews. He went completely unmemorably casual. And I'm thinking, I, I don't want to seem grow old. I, I thought he was immortal, man. And I want to remember the Jordan in 98. And I'll admit, it's, it's a little hard to hear this Jordan talking about the great old days, and it's, you know, it gets to be a little bit wistful, uh, a little bit poignant, um, almost borderline sad that, that he can't be that guy anymore. And, and Shannon, I'll, I admit it, it hurts me a little bit because I, I, I thought he'd always look like that. And I know we all age and, and I, I get all that, but that guy, that was the guy. He, he's my idol, he's my hero. And to see him now, I, I'll be the first to admit, it's a little bit, a little bit hard on my eyes. I'll get used to it. We got eight more of these episodes to go, but that's not the guy I remember in 98. Kept telling you. Yeah, I noticed that, but I noticed that on the look on the little table also. And what you also noticed that it would be like during the segment, it'd be a little bit in there. And when they come back to the next segment, it'd be filled to the top. And they kept doing that a couple of times. You saw that, Skip. Yes, the man, the I man did. likes to drink. Yes, he likes him a good stick every once in a while. But Skip, it wasn't like the man was Not slurring his speech. No, no, I mean he he wasn't slurring his speech. I mean he was. And Skip, no. the thing is what you have to understand, and this happens with a lot of athletes. A lot of athletes, they only train like they train because they play a particular sport. It's not like for you and I, it's a lifestyle. It's kind of our brand. But back when Jordan Brand was basketball. Now, Skip, you know he's done. He says, look, if I want to drink every day, I'm going to drink every day. If I want to smoke 10 cigars a day, I'm going to do it. If I want to eat ice cream, if I want to slice a pizza, Skip, some guys do that. We, and I keep telling you, because somebody does something really well, it doesn't make them less human. It just means they're really good at what they do. I've been trying to tell you this for like the last four years with Tom Brady. Tom Brady, he might not speak like Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers said, hey, I'm going home, I'm having me a nice glass of scotch, maybe the bottle, yada, yada, yada. He'll tell you. But Tom Brady probably has him a drink. He probably drank wine with his wife. They go out for social occasions. They get together at, home, at his home or something. They're probably having a good time. Skip. And that's, I think, that's one of the things. People watching this like, well, damn, Mike got him a drink. I'm going to go get me a drink. Mike smoking six. Skip, he made it cool. Now you go to every, every time I see guys, my brother, he, uh, 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 he's on the golf course. All his boys, every smoking cigars. Where they got that from? MJ. So, Skip, I loved it. Oh, my God, I'm a good old Drake. He had some of those good old brow stuff. I don't know if he was that old. That looked like some, uh, that might have been Paradise or that Richard. That might have been, that, that's that good stuff. It ain't that, you know, that that XO, that BSOP. It wasn't none of that. It's that old, it's that Paradise, that Napoleon, that Richard. That's old five, four, five thousand dollar bottle stuff, Skip. And he was drinking it too. That thing, because I looked at one of them, I'm like, dang, might get a little low. They come back, that thing to the ref. Oh, okay, might have had them top that thing off for him. That's good, Mike, good. <laughs> so, I, I hear everything you said. You're, you're right, we're different. I have never smoked anything in my life, never drank, came from a broken home childhood that was alcohol-fueled, both parents, alcoholic. So I, I just said, I don't want any part of that. So I'm probably the worst one to ask. 
and I'm not realistic about this, but quick story, Shannon. When I was the columnist in 98 at the Chicago Tribune, after they did win that sixth championship, Michael was smoking his cigar, and everybody had told me he smoked one every day on the way to games at the United Center. <clears throat> it's a long drive from where he lived in that northern sort of northwest suburb, and the traffic can be very bad, and he would smoke him. He and Ahmad Rashad would ride together to the United Center, and he would smoke a cigar every day just to calm him down. And I never said he wasn't flawed. He's flawed like everybody else is, like I am, like we all are. And yet he was so driven, supremely driven to overcome his flaws. But I thought about writing a piece for the Tribune about smoking cigars because it scared me that it sent the wrong signal to all those guys out on the golf course. And I called, a, I think he was a cancer doctor, I can't remember, just to, to try to find out just how carcinogenic cigar smoking is. And I think he told me, I could be wrong about this, I'm just off the top of my head, that one cigar equals eight cigarettes, I think, in, in impact right. of, of nicotine and, and potential carcinogenic impact on your system. So again, mm -hmm. it's, it's not great for you. And it would always scare me, like Michael does that well, he needed that, and now he enjoys that. And like I said, it's almost like a security blanket to have to calm him down, and, and I get that. I just don't love it, and I was going to write about it that time, and I didn't. I just decided I'd just let it go. He's the greatest, and if, if that's what he needs to do what he does, God bless him. Yeah, I like it. Mike, Mike cut up, cut, I'm cut from the same cloth, Mike. We like us a good drink. Skip, I, I think the thing is, is that we're not, and if you look at Mike over, say, the last decade, he's been more casually dressed. We don't see him as suited and booted as we once did. He would never give an interview unless he was impeccably dressed. Now he's more be, apt to be seen in jeans and a, and a, and a, and a shirt, a casual shirt, and it's yeah. and it always his customary Jordan brand. So I, I'm not surprised. That's yeah. who he is. He wants to, Skip, he wants to relax. And Skip, you got him in a situation, he's in his home now. He's going to be most comfortable in his home. Okay, he's like, okay, y'all want this. I got to be me. If he's sitting at home, he's probably having him a nice drink. He's having him a nice cocktail. He's probably got one of them sticks close by. And oh, Mike smoked the most slow burners, too. I'm talking about the most good sticks, Skip. I ain't talking about that little stuff that you get at the convenience store. Them things probably come at, they probably rolling them things every day for the man. So he got that good stuff. And mm -hmm. I, I don't have a problem with it at, at this point in time in his life. Let the man enjoy him. Skip, I tell you the story. My grandmother and uh, the doc, you know, she didn't have much time to live, but she wanted some fried food. And I was thinking about it. I was like, man, granted. But then I thought about it. I'm like, my grandma, 89 years old. That's the last thing. Let her enjoy her life. If that's what she wants at this point in time, let her, Michael has earned the right, Skip. Let the man enjoy his life. Now, Skip. Well, I do. And I said, I'm, Ron, I'm reaching here. I'm, I'm trying to be objective just for you. you know, Jenny asked me, is there anything I didn't like? And I cringed a little bit over that. And then I read my friend Michael Wilbon wrote a piece yesterday for ESPN.com about this is Jordan in a, in a way we've never seen him before. And I agree with that, you know, for better and for worse, because, no, I've never seen him like I've never seen him that relaxed before. He, so to speak, let his no. hair down in the interview. But but again, you have to take the good with the bad, seeing him like never before. No, Skip. Mike Wilbon said we, meaning the public, those that know Mike yeah. have seen Mike like that for the last 20 years. That's how he is. The public got an opportunity, got a glimpse to see Michael Jordan. Uh, with the with the uh, with the uh, partition down, so you get an opportunity to see Michael Jordan. It's what he does. It's who he is. Okay, there ain't no problem with that. Like I so, said, I ain't got a problem end, with it. Yeah. Okay. Well, in the end, Shannon Sharp, all I care about is the world got to see that Michael Jeffrey Jordan is the goat. Period. End no, of story. Like Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Period. End of story. We're moving on. No mercy. Over the weekend, Brett Favre weighed in on Tom Brady's departure from New England to Tampa Bay and said that he greatly commended Brady on his decision. Favre also described it as a, quote, leap of faith 
to leave New England. So, Shannon, do you agree with Brett Favre here? No, absolutely not. <laughs> Skip, this is the equivalent of people saying Phil Jackson took a leap of faith leaving the Bulls to go to the Lakers. No, he didn't. They didn't want him back. A leap of faith <laughs> is not jumping out of burning building to save myself. That's not a leap of faith. There are no other options behind me. Let me tell you what a leap of faith. I'm going to give it to you in as simple as terms as I possibly can. A leap of faith is Shannon Sharp is a lawyer. I have a successful practice, but I give that up to open up a restaurant. That's a leap of faith. You don't take a leap of faith. A leap of faith would have been for Tom Brady. He has two, three years left on his contract. He goes to Mr. Kraft. I want out. I'm not happy. You don't wait till the end of your contract. They don't give you what you want and says, I'm taking a leap of faith by leaving. That's not a leap of faith. Maybe I got, maybe I got it wrong. Jenny, I mean, Jenny, you went to BU, so you're a lot smarter than I am. So maybe I don't got the true definition of what a leap of faith is. But I don't think <laughs> someone not giving you a contract, you going to join someone else, is a leap of faith. And let's not pretend. A leap of faith, if you want to have a leap of faith, get out of your contract and go join the Bucks. Get out of your contract and go join uh, uh, Jacksonville. A leap of faith is not going to join two, uh, two uh, Pro Bowl wide receivers and a tight end that's on the cusp of going to the Pro Bowl. That's not a leap of faith. Man, stop this notion. Tom Brady, the Patriots didn't want Tom Brady. He wanted an exit strategy. A leap of faith is with two to three years left on his contract, says Mr. Kraft, I want out. That's a leap of faith. You at the end of your contract and having to go somewhere else, that's not a leap of faith. That's your only option. Uh, time out. Just recently, Ian Rappaport of NFL Network reported that Robert Kraft was holding out hope until that Monday night when Tom Brady went to his house. He was holding out hope with Mr. Kraft that they could make, they could come to terms and make a deal for the, the following year, which would be next year, if not a two-year deal. And remember, Ian Rappaport <laughs> also reported that once Brady was offered two years and 50 million, 25 and 25, by the Bucks, that Robert Kraft offered to match that. So I think we have some revisionist history here on the part of Mr. Sharp trying to say that he got pushed out the back door and had nowhere to go but south, that he had to go to Tampa. Skip. And I'm also going to point out that Jeff Darlington had reported before the free agency period that four teams were ready to sign Tom Brady and that eight were very interested. So it seemed like he had a lot of options and he chose right. at almost age 43 to take a leap of faith and sign with the team known as the Suckineers. That's a leap of faith to me. I believe that Tom Brady's team leaked information says he has four teams to one because the same guy that said it's very doubtful because so he fed him, he fed him. I don't believe Tom's going to go back. It's very doubtful, but I'm going to need you to do me this because I've also read articles said Tom Brady had two choices, the Chargers and the Bucks. Now you have, one guy says he had multiple choices. I do not believe that, Skip Bayless. I do not believe eight teams were lining up to sign a 43-year-old quarterback. I do not. And this is the same Ian Rappaport that kept saying, oh, he's going to get a long-term deal, a long-term deal. Where's that long-term deal that the Patriots are going to offer? Oh, oh, it never came. Well, maybe they did. Maybe there was a two-year <laughs> offer yeah. from them to match the Bucks offer. Tom Brady waited three years to get an extension. He waited three years to get the extension. He wanted that to make, okay, y'all wanted to move with Jimmy Garoppolo. The only thing that's going to make me feel better is you give me a long-term deal. Okay, where's that deal, Skip? And I told you, last year they gave $8 million. I said, Skip, if they wanted this man passed this year, they would. why couldn't they get Skip? It would have been more cap-friendly if you give him two years and, ex and, 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 ex and uh, uh, prorate that money over two years as opposed to just getting $8 million. They showed you what they wanted, Skip. Just like the franchise tag, Skip, prove it. One year, prove you're durable, prove you can play, and we'll give you another one. Now, Tampa didn't have a choice. What was the, what was the option? 
either Tom Brady at 43 or go back to go back with Jameis. It's like we that's they took a leap of faith because they had a choice. That was a leap of faith what they did because they had a 25, 26 year old Jameis Winston, 40, almost 5,200 yards and 33 touchdowns. But they went with Tom Brady, 43 year old. We know what his past is. We know what he's accomplished. Skip, that's a leap of faith. This ain't no leap of faith what he did. He didn't have a choice. No, wait a second. Time out. A leap of faith is a gamble. It has some fear factor to it where you have to plunge, close your eyes and plunge. The Bucs didn't have to close their eyes and plunge. They're like, thank you, God. Tom Brady fell into their laps. No. And they said, we can't yeah, wait be- to go forward with Tom Brady for two years. You, you tell me that when coaches or teams, uh, 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 play, uh, owners and teams move on for a player, you should be suspicious. Coach Belichick, now everybody says Coach Belichick is the, arguably the greatest coach of any sport. He was seen to be unwilling to give Tom Brady a contract extension. Why? Well, obviously, Bill Belichick feels like he's earned the right after 20 years with Tom Brady to prove to the world he can win a Super Bowl without Tom Brady, and I'm fine with that. I don't condemn him for that. Let's see. Here we go. But again, I, he, he had an ulterior motive that was a selfish motive. It's not that he's saying <laughs> Brady can't play anymore. He's saying, I need to, to, it's time for me. How old is he? 67. It's time for me to start proving I can win one without Tom, right? Well, here's the thing, though, Skip. He's not saying that Brady can't play. He said, I don't believe Brady can play at the level and for the money that he's expecting. That's what he believes. But Skip Bayless, we need to, Brett Favre is absolutely wrong. Tom Brady did not take a leap of faith. The leap of faith is leaving something and going anew. What did Tom Brady leave? He didn't have a contract. If he had two, three years on his contract, Skip, he asked for the Patriots to release or trade him. That's a leap of faith. Skip, you know, if, Skip, if I'm without a job, I can't say, well, I take a leap of faith. I started something new. I'm without a job. Okay, did Shannon Sharp predict that Tom would choose Tampa Bay? Because I don't think it was a no. gimme he was going to choose Tampa Bay. I think it came out of left field. Yeah. It came out of nowhere. Nobody saw that coming yeah. because they were 7-9 and nine and they have the worst history of any franchise in all of pro sports. They're the Suckineers. And Tom said, watch yeah. this. Watch what I can do there. Yeah. That's what you define as leap of faith. Bill Gates dropping out of Harvard. Starting Microsoft is a leap of faith. He had a, he could have stayed in school. He had a choice. He needed to skip. The Patriots basically said, Tom, we want to move on without you. They had three years, Skip, to extend Tom. And at the end of 2017, at the 20, end of 2018, they did not. That is not a leap of faith what he did. He went to another team after the team that he wanted to be with didn't give him the extension. That's not a leap of faith. Mark Zuckerberg dropping out of okay. B, dropping out of Harvard and starting Facebook. That's a leap of faith. How is this a leap of faith when nobody wants you? There were no options back there. No options. You don't think he could have gone into Robert Kraft on that Monday night ahead of free agency and said, hey, Let's work this out. Let's let's do one more year and make it our last hurrah together. Let's make it my swan song year. You don't think Daddy Kraft would have done it? Yes, he would have done that. And I believe what Ian Rapport reported, and you don't. Skip, it was he didn't want one year. Yes, he could have got it one year, but I don't believe it. He could have got one year to prove it. He's like, I'm beyond proving it. Give, that's why he got two years. That's why guys don't like the franchise tag. I've already proven it, or else you wouldn't have put the tag on me. I want long-term security. He wanted an extension that would have assured him that he could have played till 45 in New England. Coach Belichick, remember, Mr. Kraft co-signed Tom Brady saying play in the 45. There's only one guy, and I told you at the time he said it, that matters. That was Coach Belichick. Coach Belichick never signed up on that, Skip. This is not a leap of faith, Skip. If he'd have had two years left on that contract, he says, I want out and go somewhere else, that's a leap of faith. 
Shannon, nobody's ever done look. this in the history of pro football. No quarterback going on done 43 what? has said, I think I want to start over with Super Bowl expectations with a 7-9 and nine team. Now, all they're talking about in Tampa, Florida is Super Bowl, here we come. It's a leap of faith for him to start over in the other conference. Peyton Manning said the other day, and I don't know if it was a, a criticism or a compliment, but he said, I was surprised that Tom Brady went to the NFC. I thought he was an AFC guy. Now he's going to have to go through an initiation and learn the ropes in the NFC. Okay, well, mm -hmm. that's that's another little part of this that's a leap of faith where you're saying, I'm starting over in the other conference. It, it takes guts. It takes goat. It, it takes what Tom Brady is made of to say, watch this. Nobody predicted it. Nobody saw it coming. It's a leap of faith to take a seven and nine team and create expectations that you're going to win the NFC South over Drew Brees and Sean Payton and and leap into Super Bowl contention next year. That's, That's a leap what, of faith. Hold on, Skip. So, so, so in other words, Joe Montana took a leap of faith by leaving San Francisco. Brett Favre took a leap of faith no. by leaving Green Bay. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. They were traded. Both were traded. Joe Why? was traded to Kansas City. Brett was traded to the Jets. Brett did take a leap of faith when he joined the Vikings at age 40 because nobody had ever done that. And all Brett did, and that's why he can relate to this, that's why he's applauding from a distance, is because he, at age 40, took a Vikings team that nobody really saw as a Super Bowl contender within an overtime of getting to the Super Bowl and had arguably his greatest season, 33 touchdowns to seven interceptions, at age 40. So that was a leap of faith Skip. to do what Brett did with, with Minnesota. Skip. Skip, had Brett Favre, in his, before his contract was up, says, Packers, I want you to trade me. It wasn't until he wanted to hold out. He said he re remembers, Skip, he didn't like training camp. All He, he didn't like mini camp. So he kept retiring, unretiring. The Packers says, no, Aaron Rodgers, is, this is his job. So he's like, okay, trade me. That's what they skipped. That's not a leap of faith. He wanted his job back. He wanted that job back. Joe Montana wanted the job in San Francisco. He got hurt 91-92. I think it was, yeah, 91-92. He got hurt. Steve Young came in there, won the MVP. Joe wanted that job back. And he's like, no, that's not a leap of faith. You have no choice. You can either get released or we can trade you. That's not a leap of faith, Skip. You have to, Skip, me being a successful lawyer, wanting to open a restaurant, that's a leap of faith. I'm foregoing what I know, what I've been successful at, to start something anew. Skip, if the door is closed over here, I'm going to go check another door. That's not a leap of faith. That's, that's, that's just common sense. Shannon, why do you hate so hard on Tom Brady? I don't get it. And a lot of ex-players, they're so resentful and jealous of Tom Brady because he's doing something that is groundbreaking that no one has ever even had the ability to do, which is to say, I'm still as great as ever. I'm almost 43 and I want to play maybe five more years. And it see, drives ex-players nuts. And you, you won't applaud it, him. It you won't say, man, see, that, that took something to no. say, I'm going to start over way down in Tampa at age 43 well, and risk my legacy. Well, when you say, well, when you say, he don't care anything about his legacy, so why would he risk it? You remember he said he don't care anything about, about legacy. That's what he said, and you co-signed that. So now he cares why would he risk his legacy. But that's neither here nor there. But when you signed me to be your Robin, you didn't say I want you to applaud great performances and all this. You signed me, you, uh, signed me on to be objective. See, Skip, the problem is people think that if you don't applaud everything a great player does, you're hating on him. That is so true. We need to get past that notion. Because I dislike something or I do not agree with something doesn't mean I hate it. Skip, I love apples. That doesn't mean I hate oranges. I just like apples. Skip, you, keep, you and Brett and everybody said, oh, that was a leap of faith. That is not a leap of faith. 
The definition of leap of faith is what, Skip? Give me the definition again. And you tell me that's what he did. You, you, it has to have some risk to it, some gamble to it. There has to be a downside. There has to be some fear factor in the decision that you make. Shannon, let me do this. You just brought up that, that we started something here together in 2016. I took a leap of faith, yeah. and I will be the first to admit that, that yes, I have some personal did. appreciation on a very small level, small level of what Tom just did because – we had created a juggernaut on ESPN that was called maybe the yes. greatest success story in the history of the network because of the time slot that First Take was in. It was cold pizza, then it was yes. First Take. We went all debate for two hours. Everybody said, you're going to fail, and the ratings went through the roof. And I was sitting yes. pretty. I was on Easy Street, and they offered me a lot yes. of money to stay, and as you know, Steve, yes. Stephen A. Smith has been my brother from day one, and we're still very close yes. friends. And I said, no, at my age, I need a challenge. I want to go try something with Shannon Sharp that, that will be virtually impossible to do, and that's to break through against that juggernaut. And we did. Our yes. ratings have gone up for yes. four straight football seasons here on Undisputed, and we're proud of it. And I'm proud of you. And yes. you're not my Robin. We're Batman together. And so <laughs> I appreciate that. But it took a leap of faith on my part to come here because there was huge downside. I was giving up yes. a sure thing in, in Bristol, Connecticut. Skip, and that, thank you. And ESPN had been getting Skip Bayless to do extension after extension for years. And Skip Bayless says, no, I'm going to take a leap of faith. I'm going to go clear across the country with an upstart network. They just started doing this a couple of years before you got here. That's a leap of faith. Yep. They wanted you back and they would have they would have been willing to give you what you wanted there. But you said, no, I'm going here and I'm bringing my sidekick with me. That is what Tom did. Cause no, two years before, still, there's a risk what, involved. Yeah, yeah. I, well, Skip, anytime you go to the unknown, but it's not a leap of faith in the true definition what you did because ESPN had been getting had been trying to get you to sign an extension for years. You rebuffed them. The Patriots rebuffed Tom Brady. That's the difference. And I love how you try to insert yourself in there. I thought we wasn't inserting ourselves in there. You see, you get on me all the time, Skip Bayless, and now you insert yourself. Now you say you Tom Brady, huh? Now you Tom Brady. Somehow you found a way yeah, to become Tom Brady that. <laughs> I'd like to be the Robin in the analogy, if you will. Either way, I'm glad you all <laughs> took a leap of faith for this one. And I want to go a little bit deeper about Michael Jordan. Is he hands down the best scorer we've ever seen. I can't wait to hear what you guys think about this one. Next. No mercy. Michael Jordan is only fifth all-time in career points, but he has the highest career average with just over 30 points a game. But what's even more impressive is that only 7.2% of his career field goals were from three, and he still managed to shoot 51% for his two-point shot. So, Shannon, what does this tell you? <laughs> tell me, tell me, Michael Jordan wasn't a good three point shooter. Not what it tell me, Jenny. I can read. You can read too, Jenny. <laughs> Going to Boston University. Hey, Skip Bayless, did you know? I love how they do it. If you notice, they tried to mention that he was the goat, but they had very little topics when it came to LeBron, LeBron James in this. Now, Michael Jordan shot forty percent three times from the three point line. When they moved it back, he shot twenty nine percent. So all the years that when it was shortened. He shot 40%. When they moved it back, he shot 29. Hmm. For a career, Michael Jordan is 33% from the three-point line. LeBron James is 34. Now, last I checked, 34 was more than 33, so it's better. They mentioned that Michael Jordan was 51% on two-point shots, and they had guys like Dirk Nowitzki and all these other guys. But they ain't mentioned LeBron James is at 55%. It also highlighted his true shooting percentage. It factored in three-point shots, two-point shots, and free throw percentage, Skip, lo and behold. Michael Jordan is at 57%. LeBron James is at 59%. PR, all time. Michael Jordan is at 27.9. LeBron is at 27.5. Oh, my goodness. 
So they're trying to highlight, but Michael Jordan is just by far and away the GOAT. When everything that they said that it looks like LeBron is the GOAT. LeBron has led his team in assists 17 straight years. Michael Jordan has done that five times. But all the championship years, it was Scott, it was uh, Scottie Pippen. LeBron, led, this would be the first time in his career that LeBron will not lead the team in scoring. So 16 or 17 years. Remember, Michael only played 15 seasons. Skip, but here's the thing. Did you, an article highlighted that Michael Jordan assisted. Oh, he assists. He assisted 25% of his teammates' basket when he was on the floor. LeBron James is 36%. So I'm glad y'all made this article because what it did was confirm what we always knew to be true. LeBron James the GOAT. Thank you. And I didn't even have to commission the article. I love when I do that. When somebody do something for you, Skip, when someone does something out of the kindness of their heart and you didn't ask for it, you should be appreciative of it. Thank you for writing this article and making sure that everybody knows that LeBron is the GOAT. Thank you. Now, unfortunately, I have to undo everything you just did. I have to correct all the misstatements, all the inaccuracies you just spewed all over our network. Let me start from the start. Michael Jordan is the all-time career leader in player efficiency rating. I think it's the best stat in pro basketball and the one that is most indicative. And, And LeBron is just behind him, but he's still just behind him. That's GOAT. And then Michael Jordan is the all-time career leader, if we can go second level, in win shares per 48 minutes. That's a big one for all all those stat heads out there. But Michael Jordan is the career leader. That is GOAT. The point of the two-point shot is not two-point shots all over the court because obviously LeBron drives the ball more than Michael Jordan did because LeBron is simply the greatest driver of the basketball ever. I've said that a thousand times. I may say it a thousand more times. We're talking about mid-range jump shots. That's from 10 feet to 16 feet out, in-between range shot. In between the lane, obviously, and the three-point line is a mid-range jump shot that, that feels almost obsolete in today's NBA. It has always been LeBron's weakness. It's been that and his free throw shooting have been weaknesses. He's not a good mid-range jump shooter, while Michael was simply the greatest mid-range jump shooter we have ever seen. Right now, LeBron career from 10 to 16 feet is only 37%. Michael was 51% on jump shots from 10 to 16 feet. That's extraordinary. If you look at the last 22 years, at makes from 10 to 16 feet for a, a season, Michael in that last dance season, 97, 98, he made 671 mid-range jump shots. Nobody's even come close to that in the last 22 years. The closest was Dirk in 2006, made 564. That was 107 fewer than Michael made in the last dance season. So the point of the article to me is that Michael Jordan was the deadliest jump shooter, mid-range jump shooter we've ever seen. He didn't try many three-point shots. For his career, he averaged 1.7 per game. LeBron averages 4.3 three-point attempts per game. So LeBron is a much higher volume three-point shooter. And to your point, LeBron's made 34% to 33% because it's emphasized. It's a huge part of LeBron's game. He is most likely to either pull up and shoot a three or maybe jack up a three or drive it into the lane and try to either score it or maybe wind up at the foul line. So the point is, well, it, at, at the mid-range, 37% to Michael's 51%. Goat. Skip, you, you, make, you make my point. The mid-range is not emphasized, so nobody's going to be close to that. Nobody might not ever tro- co- uh, approach that number again because you either lay the ball in the basket or you shoot the three. They said two-point shot. They said two-point. Now, two-point percentage, 51. That's what they said, two points. So, so, I, so let me get. So, if I lay the ball up in the basket and I don't get fouled, you shoot a ten point, a ten foot shot, and don't get fouled. If and we both make it, it's two points, right? Okay. You see what they try to do is they try to emphasize. 
to try to what we try to just give it and I get this. You, you what you try to do is you try to highlight certain things to try to make your argument look good. And that's why they left LeBron out. Cuz LeBron is uh, uh, two point percentage is higher than Michael Jordan. But can you ask me this, Kevin? And everybody keep telling me cuz you you've been notorious for this. If Michael Jordan wanted to average a triple double, if he wanted to lead the league in assists, he would have well, if LeBron James wanted to be more of a scorer, don't you think he would have scored? Because he let, the mere fact, if you lead the league one time in scoring, you could probably do it again, right? Yeah, that's what they say about defense. If you yeah, play defense in one game, you, go ahead. You don't think what? I, I don't think you could have led it 10 times. Michael led the league in scoring 10 times to one for LeBron. But, Michael is a but better all-around scorer of the basketball than LeBron is. So can you answer? Can you answer me this? And they factored the season in which he only played eighteen games. Uh, well, eighteen games in eighty four, and I think he played twenty games in uh two, in ninety five. LeBron. So basically, that's about thirteen and a half years. LeBron has played seventeen seasons. Why did Michael Jordan attempt more field goals in thirteen and a half years than LeBron did in seventeen seasons? Can you tell me that, Skip? And LeBron has passed it. Yeah, because he was. He was the alpha on his team. He was the guts. He was the clutch shooter. He wanted the basketball and get out of his way. Could he have averaged 10 assists a game? You better believe he could have. But he knew Why he could he? score it the way nobody's ever been able to score it. So he scored it, and they won six championships and six tries, and he was the MVP <laughs> six times in the finals. Case closed. But Thank see, you for asking. But see, when I... Oh, hold on. But when I tell you if LeBron James wanted to lead the league and score four or five or six times, well, why didn't he? Now you tell me if Michael Jordan wanted to average 10 assists a game, he could have. Well, why didn't he? All I'm asking you, look, Jordan put his emphasis on scoring. Can LeBron score the basketball? 27.2 says absolutely he can. But a guy that has that, that's averaging eight assists, a guy that has the assist total, he's going to be when it's all said and done, Skip, he might be, he's going to be the number one leading scorer. This definitely hurt us right here because we could have picked up an extra an extra thousand points right here. We could have picked that up in the basket, but that's neither here nor there. But, no, not 25. He's averaging 25, so another 25. So about 450. So another 500 points. We could have picked up 500 points. So because you never know when down the line. But, Skip, all I'm saying is, is that if LeBron would have emphasized scoring the basketball, because in order to score the basketball, you got to have a lot of field goal attempts. And so LeBron did not prioritize scoring the basketball. So all I'm saying is, is that this article did me a favor. I was going to have to pay somebody like 100 bucks to commit to uh, write me an article like this, and they did it for me for free. <laughs> I have to appreciate that. Shannon Sharp, I have always told you LeBron is still the best passer in basketball. LeBron is a better passer than Michael ever was, a little bit. Michael had the gene in him, the passing gene. He just wasn't asked to utilize it by Phil Jackson through his Chicago days. Phil said, we need you to score it. We need you to score it at the end of clocks. We need you to score it at the end of games. And he was simply a better scorer than LeBron was or is. So the oh. point is, yeah, LeBron can stuff those stat sheets, and it's too bad that it just, oh. we, we lost part of this season here because he could have stuffed that stat sheet because he was leading the league in fourth quarter shot attempts when we all got quarantined. Think about that. The guy who's not really a high-volume shooter scorer was leading in fourth quarter attempts and that's in a lot of blowouts over the Atlanta Hawks and uh, teams of that. I, lo I love that what you I love that what you said because a Hall of Fame coach and Phil Jackson said, uh, uh, "Michael, we need you to score." But LeBron has yet to play for a Hall of Fame coach, I believe. And they say, "LeBron, we need you to score, assist, and rebound." Michael, we just need you to score. We are gonna let Scottie Pippen, we gonna let Scottie Pippen assist the ball. We gonna let Dennis Rodman or those bigs rebound the ball. But everybody said, LeBron James, we need you to score, rebound, and assist. Hell, LeBron said, hell, I wish I just had one task. I could just score the basketball because I'd have been dropping 32, 33 for the first seven, eight, nine years of my career, like you know who. But I was asked to do everything. You know what I'm saying, Skip Bayless? When I was a little boy, they say, well, Shannon, all you gotta do is uh, cut the grass. My sister had to cut the grass, had to feed the hogs, had to make dinner, had to watch over me. She had four tasks. 
So my job was easy. I had one. She had four. My brother had three. I had one. Well, Michael Jordan got one task, score the basketball. LeBron James got three. Whose job more difficult? <laughs> okay, so, much so LeBron gets I to feed you. the hogs. <laughs> That's how it is. No mercy. In the first two episodes of Michael Jordan's The Last Dance documentary was just how underpaid Scottie Pippen really was heading into that 1997-98 season. Even though Pippen led the Bulls in several stat categories and Michael Jordan said himself that you can't mention my name without mentioning Scottie Pippen. So Shannon, I want to ask you, in your opinion, how valuable was Pippen to Michael Jordan? He was immensely valuable because, Kevin, you have to remember that uh, Jordan got swept in 87 by the Celtics, which was Scottie's rookie year. He got swept in 86, which was Jordan's second year. And he lost 3-1 to the Bucks in uh, his first year uh, in the playoffs. What Scottie Pippen allowed Michael Jordan to do, Skip, was focus on what he was great at, arguably the greatest to ever do it, which is score the basketball. Because Pip could assist the ball, and he could also, because he was so long, because he, he did it so effortlessly, effortlessly, he could take their best scoring option. Be it a point guard, two guard, three or four. Scottie Pippen was probably a better defender than Michael Jordan Skip for the simple fact he could guard more positions. He was taller. That wingspan was a problem for a lot of people. So he allowed Michael Jordan to be Michael Jordan. Michael didn't have to worry about facilitating the offense because Scottie Pippen was what we call the first point forward Skip. Uh, he, was unbelie- he was unbelievable at that. Uh, he was very good. Well, I wouldn't say he's the first. Larry Bird was really the per- per- first point forward, Skip. He did it before Scottie Pippen, but Scottie gets a lot of credit for him. Um, I think he was very, very important to Michael. Michael says there can be no Michael Jordan without mentioning Scottie Pippen. Skip, he was not the elite scorer, but he did all the other things so extremely well, which allowed Michael to focus on scoring the basketball. And Michael could deal. So I don't want people to think that Michael Jordan was a slouch on the defensive end because he was anything but that. Nine times first team all defense, defensive player of the year, I think 88-89 season. So that lets you know. But Skip Pip was as good a wing defender as that we'll ever have or will ever have. And he allowed Michael Jordan to, to escape, to be free, to just worry about scoring the basketball and not have so much on his plate. So I don't believe we could have had this story, the last dance, without Scottie Pippen because I don't believe 91 through 93 and 96 through 98 happened if Scottie Pippen is not on that team. I'm just glad you corrected yourself. Trust me on this. Scottie Pippen was not a better defender than Michael Jeffrey Jordan. Michael Jordan was the defensive player of the year and nine times, as you point yeah. out, first team, all defense. He was extraordinary. He was a game changer on defense. He was a disruptor. We saw him steal the ball from Carl Malone in that fateful game six of his final run in the last dance finals against Utah at Utah. And yet I want to make the point that Michael never campaigned, go get Scotty, go acquire Scotty. He just didn't care. It's not like LeBron campaigning, I need Anthony Davis or LeBron joining forces with Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh or LeBron saying Dwayne's knees are shot. I got to go back. I got to join forces with Kyrie and Kevin Love back in Cleveland for my second time around. It wasn't like that. They did draft Scottie Pippen, and I was hard on Jerry Krause yesterday. I give him credit. He did draft him. I give him that. And yet, Michael wasn't clamoring for help. He just sort of came up with Scottie, and they grew up together in, in a way. Michael was a little bit older, but... But again, Michael was a baby in those times you bring up early on. And once he grew up, he grew way up. And he had to put some pounds on and some muscle on to be able to defeat the Pistons, thanks to Tim Grover, his trainer. And yet, once he grew up, he grew completely up. And when, in the end, you could see, Shannon, I was there in 98. Scotty was a very good player, but he wasn't an all-time great player. And yes, Michael said all the right things the other night in the documentary about how much Scotty meant to him because he did mean a lot to him. He was his Robin and he was an excellent Robin, but Scotty had no Batman in him whatsoever. Case in point, remember the one year, the one complete year that Michael was gone back in 93, 94, Mm -hmm. 
Scotty had a very good year. He averaged 22, nine and six and made the all-star team. And because there was no Jordan, he got a number of votes for MVP. He finished third that year in MVP. But once they got to the second round of the playoffs, you'll remember against the Knicks, a series they lost in seven games. In game three in Chicago, you remember what happened. At the end of the game, Scotty yes. committed a blunder where he was waving Kukoc over to, to set a screen and he let the shot clock get too deep and he shot it too late and the buzzer went off and they had a clock violation. And then... Once Ewing scored to tie the score, Phil called timeout, Phil Jackson, and called the last play for Tony Kukoc because Kukoc was the closer for that team. He had made four buzzer beaters that year to win games with jump shots. Scotty wasn't the Jordan replacement. Actually, Kukoc was. And so when Phil called mm -hmm. the last play, it was Scotty inbounding to Kukoc. Scotty just waved out. He just couldn't take it anymore and went and sat on the bench and wouldn't even go in the game. So Phil said, okay, and he sent Pete Myers in to throw the ball and bounce to Kukoc, who then made the shot to win the game. And then to cap this off, look what happened after the last dance. Scotty was only 33 years of age, and he went to Houston and joined Hakeem and, Bar and uh, Charles Barkley. And they were pretty right. good, but they lost in four games to the Lakers in a best of five in the first round. And Charles was, I mean, uh, uh, Scotty was the third wheel on that team in points scored behind Akeem and behind Charles Barkley. Come and on. then Scotty goes to Portland for four more years and he, he averages 11, five and five. And in that first go around at Portland, remember, they played the Lakers and played them great all the way to game seven. And they were up 71 Love to seven. 58 going to the fourth quarter of game seven. And what happened? Scotty didn't happen. They wanted him to be Jordan, and in the fourth quarter, he played almost the whole fourth quarter and scored no points and went 0 for 3, and they blew the whole lead and blew the game, to the, to obviously, what? to the Shaq Lakers at that to point. Like, so, so right. to me, he, he got exposed. He, yeah. For me, Skip, Scotty was never Michael. He, was, he never had that, that capacity, Skip. But I think it took Scotty growing up, too, because remember, Skip, he had to toughen up also because the knock on him was you punish him. You knock him down. You look at some of those Bad Boy Pistons documentary and see how they treated Scotty Pippen. They treated him just like they treated Jordan. You come into the lane, we going upside your head. And it had, he had to toughen up. He had to grow up also, Skip. And you keep saying Michael didn't campaign because he had competent people in the front office that they drafted Scotty Pippen. They drafted, guess what they did? They traded one of Jordan's best friends, Charles Oakley, and got it up, went and got a Bill Cartwright because they needed size in order to compete with the Knicks, in order to compete with the bad boy Pistons. So LeBron wouldn't have to do, wouldn't have to ask if he had people in the front office that would do their job. See, the problem that I have with you, Skip, yeah, man, is you said because Jordan didn't ask. Well, LeBron wouldn't ask either. If he'd have had first rate people, that go to the Hall of Fame, if he had a, a, a Pat Riley, if he had a Jerry West, if he had competent people in the front office doing the job, he wouldn't need to ask. But since they won't do his job, I got to lead the team in points, rebound and assist, and I got to do the front office job by asking you, man, go get me some help. If Michael Jordan in 1998 had had Kuzma and B.I. and Lonzo and JaVale and Rondo, he would have said, I'm good. Watch what we can do with this. He was a greater leader and, and had greater aura and mystique and the ability to lift a whole franchise than LeBron does. LeBron was like, eh, I can't win with this. Bad body language, everybody quitting. He wanted to trade the whole team. He, he needed another superstar. And Michael did not need another superstar. So what was so what was Dennis Robin? Dennis Robin was two-time defensive player of the year. He led the, from the time he got he led the league in rebounding every year he was with the Bulls. His first year with the Bulls, he, Scotty, and Mike were first team all defense. So uh, uh, Dennis Robin led the league in rebounding for seven straight years, but he's a bum. Had let Skip Bayless tell you. Scotty Pippen just made the all-star team. And when as a matter of fact, after they won the finals, they won 53 games in 93. The next year, Jordan leaves, 94. He missed the whole season. They win 55. Scottie Pippen is an uh, all-star game MVP. He finished third. So, Skip, this notion that he was a bomb is not true. Was he on Jordan level? 
No, absolutely not. But I do not believe the first three-peat or the second three-peat happens without Scottie Pippen, without Scottie Pippen being Scottie Pippen. And sometimes, Skip, Deion Branch, look at him, Skip. He was never the same player once he left Tom Brady in that system. He got $11, $12 million to go to Seattle and had to come back. So that doesn't take away from who he is. Yeah, maybe he's not an all-time great receiver. But in that system, with Michael Jordan, he was a historically great. Celtics would have been, Skip, had Casey Jones and Sam Jones or Tommy Heisen in their prime played elsewhere. But because they played with Russell and they played with Kuzi, they had Havlicek. So it happens like that sometimes, Skip. But I believe Michael Jordan, in order to be who he was, Scottie Pippen helped allow him to be that. Shannon, Michael Jordan won with Luke Longley and Bill Winnington at center. Enough said, case closed. But, but you make it seem like <laughs> he beat Elijah Wong. You make Scottie it seem Pippen like he beat David Robinson at center. <laughs> All right, all right, we're leaving it, we're leaving it, because here's the thing, Tom Brady got in trouble in Tampa, and I will tell you exactly what happened next on Undisputed. No mercy. Welcome back to Undisputed. Guys, Tom Brady is already getting in a little trouble, according to Tampa's mayor. Tom was seen working out at a local park, but was kicked out by a city worker because the parks are closed due to coronavirus. Shannon, what do you make of this? Tom's in trouble. Oh, oh really, Skip? He's so different. My grandfather would say, boy, given the choice to do right or wrong, and there's no one there to hold you accountable for the wrong, more times than not, people will do wrong. The ordinance says nobody in the park. Not if you've won six Super Bowls. Not if you're new to Tampa. Not if you're an MVP. No one in the park. Why don't the rules apply to him, Skip? Now, you jumped on that. Seems like the tone death. They're hugging during the virus. And Lamar Jackson and Antonio Brown, they don't get it. These athletes don't get it. I need that venom. I need that same energy that you gave them last week. I need that for Tom Brady. I'm done talking. I don't want to talk no more. I want you to take all this time to put that on Tom Brady. Go ahead. At least Tom didn't post it on IG, right? No, no, so, no, 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 over the years, I, I've read and heard about a number of athletes finding ways to get in trouble in Tampa, but this never was on the list before. So I, it seemed like he might have been, even been by himself. I mean, that's how it was presented. But is it possible Tom Brady just thought, I, I don't know where to go. Everything's closed. I'm going to go to a local park and work out by myself. Maybe his trainer was there. Maybe he was playing catch with somebody. I don't know that for a fact. But you, can you imagine how startled the city worker was to walk up on Tom Brady and say, oh, Mr. Brady. I mean, he's the savior oh, yeah. of your Buccaneers. He's the biggest story in, in sports right now. And he's by himself, we think, in a park working out. And I get it's, uh, that it's against the rules. And it seems like, Shannon, that, that Tom Brady, the great Brady, could, could at least figure out a way to, to communicate with the local high school coach who would let him in to work out on the no. high school field, something like that. But no, Tom thinks well, he, so little. He, he's so humble. He just thought, I'll just go to the park and work out by myself. No, stop that. There ain't no humble. Tom Brady so thought he was so he was Tom Brady and he was above what everybody else was required to do. That's what Tom Brady thought, Skip Bayless. And you keep making excuses. But that city worker wasn't started enough like, hey, Tom Brady, oh, you just like the rest of the people. You will break the rules also if no one's here to hold you accountable. Get your butt out of this part. All right, Tom, train inside like the rest of us. That is it for Undisputed. We'll be back same time tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Eastern. Have a good day, guys. Thank <laughs> you.